Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the weekend was pleasant. Let me start with macro thoughts on the 27th of January. Um, whilst I was writing about the risks around the coronavirus, I concluded that markets bought gold and G7 bonds on Friday as investors dived into safe havens. And I said the following week we could see these moves turn parabolic. And then I quoted the parabola, it is a curve each of them feels unmistakably. It is the parabola, they must have guessed, once or twice guessed, and refused to believe that everything always, collectively, had been moving toward that purified shape, latent in the sky, that shape of no surprise, no second chance, no return. And uh, the exponential nature of the parabola is kind of reflective of the exponential risks around uh, a virus in a hyper-connected world. Home thoughts. There was always one winner. That was Joaquin Phoenix for the Oscar 2020s. Well deserved. Um, I went to watch it and it was so gripping. My mother always tells me to smile and put on a happy face. She told me I had a purpose to bring laughter and joy to the world. He is a phenomenal actor. I came across a guy called G.S. Bogel, who's extraordinarily cryptic and intelligent in his tweets, and I learned from him the Dunning-Kruger effect, a proficiency in meta-recognition. So uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, awareness of the limitations of cognition thinking requires a proficiency in metacognition thinking about thinking. In other words, being stupid makes you too stupid to realize how stupid you are. As Marcus Aurelius observed, we suffer more often in imagination than in reality. Focusing illusion, nothing is ever as important as what you're thinking about while you're thinking about it. E.g. worrying about a thing makes the thing being worried about seem worse than it is. And then he quotes Marcus Aurelius, we suffer more often in imagination than in reality. I still adore uh, these works of art by Carlos Cruz Diaz. This is Physique Chromie, 1112 Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, in the USA. I return to William Burroughs, and you'll see why in a moment. A paranoid is someone who knows a little of what's going on. This fellow, come see this Kiswahili-speaking Mzungu fan of Aston Villa. And uh, somehow or other, Clive Wanguthi has found this uh, Swahili-speaking uh, fan of Aston Villa, who's very dynamic. Watch the short video. This is an aerial view of flamingos on Lake Nakuru, photo by Michel Dennis Huot via Kenya Pix. Lake Nakuru is beautiful. I haven't been there for many years. And this is Isola del Amore Watamu, photo by Roberto Emiliano again. We actually stayed where that photo has been taken. It is a very beautiful beach, very Italian as well. The French Romantic poet Alfred de Musset wrote the following words at the end of the Napoleonic era. We live with one foot on the ashes and the other on the seeds. That was Carlos Fuentes and the Prince of Asturias Award for Literature, 1994. 
we are influenced by a worldwide infonet, but we are informed of very little because we have lost the organic relationship between experience, information and knowledge. This is an age of information explosion and significance implosion. You know what is most difficult of wild art life management, managing the humans, this is Parveen Kaswan. Even after blocking the road by staff, this person decided to cross it while others were waiting, just missed by a fraction of a second from becoming a memory. Don't do this ever. Um, Kaushik C. Basu, we search for extraterrestrial life horizontally on other planets, other solar systems, but there can be life on another dimension. Our known universe may be lodged inside an atomic-sized particle of another gigantic universe, maybe inside the toe of a huge intelligent being. Political reflections, this is Trump's acquittal speech compared to Bill Clinton's acquittal speech. It's about a minute long from the recount and kind of sums things up. And that took me back to the moment of vision, the eyes see nothing. Trump was dancing with the sunset and strong winds when he walked to the Oval Office from Marine One on South Lawn. This photo is by William Moon at the Photo White House. Quite an extraordinary photo which went very viral. Okay, now let's go back to the subject at hand, which is the novel coronavirus. Within the next 24 hours, the number of people killed by the novel coronavirus in six weeks will exceed the number killed during the nine-month SARS outbreak. That's Dr. Tom Frieden. That took me to Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. In an article in 2014 about Ebola, I called it the moment of escape velocity and wrote then that viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. Malcolm Gladwell described the tipping point as the name given to that moment in an epidemic when a virus reaches critical mass. It's the boiling point. It's the moment on the graph when the line starts to shoot straight upwards. And uh, Virilio, I borrowed escape velocity from Virilio. This model shows the most probable routes that the novel coronavirus will take to spread from the international airport in Beijing to airports around the world. Bubble size represents relative risk at each airport. Um, then PNAS, acceleration of evolutionary spread by long-range dispersal. Pathogens, invasive species, rumours or innovations spread much more quickly around the world nowadays than in previous centuries. The speed-up is caused by more frequent long-range dispersal, for example, via air traffic. These jumps are crucial because they can generate, generate satellite outbreaks at many distant locations, thus rapidly increasing the total rate of spread. We present a simple intuitive argument that captures the resulting spreading patterns. We show that even rare long-range jumps can transform the spread of simple epidemics from wave-like to a very fast type of metastatic growth. More generally, our approach can be used to describe how new evolutionary variants spread and thus improves our predictive understanding of the speed of Darwinian adaptation. Then he produces TVRB, Insight into the Spatial Behaviour of Epidemics, 
from O'Hallett's and colleagues, an initial outbreak will grow in its highly connected environment and subsequently seed outbreaks in other locations. Um, and uh, have a look at the diagram is posed. Now he's saying that the coronavirus in Wuhan went from an index case in November 2019 to several thousand cases by mid-January 2020, thus going from initial seeding event to widespread local transmission in the span of 10 weeks. We believe that international seeding events started to occur in mid-January. Thus, we have a critical 10 weeks from then to late March to contain these nascent outbreaks before they become sizable. And that's again what I was speaking about, escape velocity, the non-linearity and exponential risks. Now, to that point, Dr. Ferguson, this is uh, an epidemiologist, shows China has 50,000 new cases and it's doubling every six days. This was reported by Bianco Research. Now, China reports the total receiving any medical attention. This includes infected, suspected, quarantined and others. Current at 300 and 72,000 and rising about 40,000 a day. Is this the most accurate measure from China? One patient admitted to a hospital in Wuhan infected at least 10 healthcare workers and four other patients. This is a reminder of super spreaders and the cases that we're now having in France um, seem to be have been triggered by a super spreader in Singapore. Chinese government are only suspecting these people have been exposed and therefore are going to quarantine them with people who have coronavirus and that's why you're seeing these very uh, alarming scenes of people refusing to be taken away and they're fighting because they don't want to be quarantined with people infected and when you look at those hospitals they're hardly being separated from each other. Presumed human-to-human -human hospital associated transmission of the coronavirus was suspected in 41% of patients. So they are a morgue, these hospitals. Um, David B. Collum, who I follow, says a cruise ship is almost a laboratory setting. Now we're learning the Japan cruise ship said to have about 60 more virus infections TBS Diamond Princess infections now at 124, roughly 300 of 3,711 have been tested. Now, that's a huge ratio. And the issue is, are they identifying those most at risk? Um, that's something we've got to find out. And the problem is, look at, the, see this, this was from the real David Jensen, large amounts of the virus in the sewage contaminated the ventilation system and spread through air ducts uh, was a situation of extensive exposure and that's why I think the cruise ship is such a thing. White House scientists have asked its uh, White House has asked scientists to investigate the origins of the coronavirus. The White House on Thursday asked U.S. scientists and medical researchers to investigate the scientific origins of the novel coronavirus, as misinformation about the outbreaks outbreak spreads online. The director of the OSTP, Kelvin Drugemeyer, wrote in the letter to the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Marcia McNutt, that a widely disputed paper on the origins, subsequently withdrawn, had shown the urgency for accurate information about the genesis of the outbreak. He called for a meeting of experts, particularly world-class geneticists, coronavirus experts and evolutionary biologists. There's always that concern, Dr. Anthony Fauci said, 
And one of the things that people are doing right now is very carefully looking at sequences to see if there's even any possibility, much less likelihood, that that's going on. And you could ultimately determine that. So people are looking at it, but right now the focus is on what we're going to do about what we have. In the article on the 3rd of February, I touched on this. And I'll come to it in a second. But look at this. Coronavirus is a master of linear math. Charlie underscore box, 2.1%, 2.1%, 2.1%, 2.1%, 2.1%, and continues to be 2.1%, except I think today they try to play around with that. So 3rd of February, I said, look, uh, I was quoting an article I was reading, looking at the phylogenetic tree recently published, derived using all the full genome sequence, we see that the coronavirus does not have a clear monophyletic support given the bootstrap value of 75. Now, theories are going around that the 2019 coronavirus specifically targets people with ACE2 receptors, which are predominantly Asians. Jumping again, a novel sequence in 2019 coronavirus, we confirm this by a sequence alignment. Here's the dot plot, and this is the argument that gap is where it's been interfered with. Now, ACE2 is angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 in the lung, has been recognized as the key receptor of the 2019 novel coronavirus as people may get infected through the respiratory tract. And what they're saying is, theories have been going around that the coronavirus specifically targets people with ACE2 receptors, and these people are predominantly of Asian origin. The CMP's quick translation of the notice from the CAC, basically they are now um, censoring Tencent, Sina Weibo and ByteDance, who are now under special supervision. Which takes me back to that quote I uh, used in the 27th of January article, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Um, Groucho Marx. A doctor in Wuhan has leaked information from Huo Shenshan, the new 1,000-bed hospital quarantine facility on 4chan that suggests upwards of 200 to 400 deaths are occurring per day, many more than being reported. Then I came across this report of, from windy.com, which shows a massive release of sulfur dioxide gas from the outskirts of Wuhan, commonly associated with the burning of organic matters. Next closest is Chongqing, at roughly 800 UG by, uh, divided by M-3, um, saying a couple of distinct possibilities, a power plant releasing all this gas, Wuhan is burning municipal trash and possibly contaminated animal carcasses, and the third and most morbid, uh, dead bodies are being burned on the outskirts of the city, the death numbers are way higher than the CCP is letting on about, and things are really, really bad. Um, Intel Wave says, I don't know the relative probabilities of these events. Make up your own mind as to which is most likely. Two citizens covering the virus go missing after they shared viral videos of how dire things are. Um, uh, imprisoned at home at shooting that viral eight bodies in five minutes video, Fang Bin says this coronavirus is more of a man-made disaster. Here you see a rare glimpse of how CCP's internet police monitoring everything you're doing, internet police in China, and Xi Jinping, of course, and I've written about it before, is a proponent of algorithmic control. Eric Lee, fascinating interview in the Financial Times, how do you block a country of 1.4 billion people? He's a Beijing, pro-Beijing venture capitalist. Um, 
uh, and uh, uh, Gideon Rackman shares lunch with him. As I step out of the car, a hostess in a pink tunic and wearing a headset is hovering on the pavement. She sweeps me across a small courtyard in some stairs, along a corridor that is painted black and dimly lit, and into a room at the back, mark, back marked VIP. A long table has been laid out for two. The restaurant's founder, Lan Gu Jin, is one of the most famous chefs in China and has been described by the FT as the new emperor of Chinese gastronomy. The guest I'm waiting for is Eric Lee, a Shanghai-based venture capitalist and political commentator who plays a very unusual role in the conversation between China and the West. We're taking the set lunch menu, which shows that after the eight appetizers, there will be 11 courses to come. Um, I decide to make a start and slurp down the cold jelly with grape sauce and fried tortillas. It is utterly delicious, a mixture of sweet and sour tastes and smooth and crunchy textures. The restaurant's signature dish, golden silk noodles with cabbage heart. The noodles are made of duck egg yolks and take many hours to produce and roughly 30 seconds to devour. Once again, 10 out of 10. Um, Lee describes the coronavirus as the medical equivalent of a natural disaster. State capacity and a collective culture are the two uniquely strong characteristics of China's political system and social construct that will ultimately enable the country to successfully combat this crisis. When I press ahead anyway, he orders a Riesling, says that's the best with Chinese food, um, it was during the Cultural Revolution, which was a chaotic time, so my mother thought it was better for me to be with my grandparents here in Shanghai, um, use the California model of venture capital funding for his own firm, Chengwei Capital. Um, uh, then he's talking about Trump and saying, you know, the Trumps, if Trump is serious about denying the China, China's rise, it's going to be a bad thing. They then have a caviar and shrimp parfait. We're living the corrupt Shanghai life. This is bad. Ostentation displays of ostentatious displays of wealth are out of fashion in Xi's China. I'm glad I'm not a politician. The government, no government official could eat like this now. None. Um, then they get abalone, a sea snail that is both super expensive and I later I guiltily discover endangered. China's rise so far has been bigger and faster than them all, he says, yet not a single shot fired, not a single country invaded. By contrast, the rise of others was accompanied by incredible bloodshed, violent wars, colonization, the subjugation of entire peoples, slavery, even genocide. Um, and then he's describing the Xinjiang camps. While they are a harsh solution, they're not Abu Ghraib, he says, in reference to the prison in Iraq, where American troops were found to have tortured detainees. In contrast to Abu Ghraib, he argues, the Xinjiang camps are peaceful places. They're almost like schools, but if you ask me, would I want to be there? Of course, the answer is no. Whether or not this will be judged a success, only history can tell. Um, as we talk, we're sipping on a blood-red soup with sea cucumbers floating in it, which, took, which look a little like grenades. He says, I'm a Xi Jinping fan. I might as well put that on the table. I might as well come out of the closet. I ask if he really spends time studying Xi Jinping thought, and he assures me that he does. I'm on the app, he says, reaching for his phone, which has the little red app. A Xi Jinping thought installed on it. Look, it's on the first page. He taps on the app, glances at it, and then says, whoops, I didn't register today. Using the app regularly is seen as a sign of loyalty to President Xi. Slightly needlingly, I ask him, what are the best bits in Xi Jinping thought? Oh, there's so much to choose from, he says. But I guess for me, the stress on the environment if you think about it, China today is at a similar stage domestically and economically to Teddy Roosevelt's America, becoming a world power, but not quite there yet. 
Um, then he's a trustee of the China Institute at Fudan University in Shanghai, but a move that has appalled Chinese liberals, Fudan has just removed a commitment to freedom of thought from its statutes. I asked Lee about this and he gives me a chillingly, chilling account of China's new order. For a period of several decades, the Chinese nation has been debating what kind of government and society they want. There are people who are liberals who want a liberal country. I think that debate is over. Um, and that lunch looks pretty delicious. Of course, I would not eat the abalone. Um, now, going back to Xi Jinping, you know, as I wrote in May 2019, in one fell swoop, Xi Jinping was president for life. I wrote then he's on a pedestal, uh, faced with a strongman conundrum, the political brand will not permit a retreat, let alone a surrender. And that's why his absence, the presence of his absence is so arresting. Um, I was watching uh, World This Week, which is a great program on France 24, and C.S. Dickey said this really is possibly a black swan moment. President Xi had told a gathering of senior officials that they must be on guard against black swans and grey rhinos, which could threaten the rule of the Communist Party. Um, that was in January. <clears throat> black swans are events that cannot be predicted but have a profound impact on markets, while grey rhinos are known risks that have the potential to cause great harm but which people choose to ignore. Um, good reasons why Z said on Monday that epidemic prevention and control would not only affect people's lives and health, but also China's social and economic stability, and it's opening up to the outside world. A statement released by Xinhua said the leaders acknowledged the epidemic posed a major test of China's system and capacity for governance, and we must sum up the experience and learn from it. In 2018, China contributed about 28% of global economic growth, according to official data, and that's why what's happening there is of such import. Virus has spread to more than 20 countries, and many of them have effectively put China under quarantine by cancelling flights to the country and barring travellers from China, the country's role in international trade, and as a key player in the global supply chain, have also been put to an acute test. But what worries Chinese leaders most is that the epidemic and the initial cover-up by the local officials could prompt mainland citizens to direct their anger towards the party's authoritarian and centralised system. Epidemic has highlighted a woefully inadequate public health system and its emergency response mechanism. Thursday's sad news about the death of Li Wenlang, a doctor in Wuhan, who was cautioned by the police for sounding the alarm over the virus before he was sickened by it, has become a rallying cry on social media. This time around, restoring people's trust and confidence in the party system and capacity for governance will be a lot harder. And that took me to William Burroughs, whose very famous quote, smash the control images, smash the control machine. And the point is, a non-linear and exponential virus represents the greatest risk to a control machine, in point of fact. This is a tweet I saw from Hyung Ziang, and in fact, the lack of free speech has meant information did not percolate upwards. Um, I would venture, as I said in October 2019, on the occasion of China at 70, that Xi's High water mark is behind him. And I wrote then, the world in the 21st century exhibits viral, wildfire, and exponential characteristics and feedback loops, which only become obvious in hindsight. And I think the virus is one of those. I also quoted Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. The vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is no remembrance of former things nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. In my article, China Turns 70, I was quoting the Lilo Longing on a large scale makes history. Very hard-hitting article by William Yang for DW News, quoting Zhang Lifan. In a way, this epidemic exposes another kind of virus in China, 
which is the virus of bureaucracy. China's governance system remains totalitarian and hierarchical, smash the control machine, rather than modernized. It is clear that China hasn't truly modernized its governance system, and 17 years after the SARS epidemic, it also hasn't established a public epidemic prevention system. In a way, this epidemic exposes another kind of virus in China, which is the virus of bureaucracy. China's governance system remains totalitarian and hierarchical rather than modernized. Um, Chinese government mishandling of the epidemic has a lot to do with its censorship. However, in order to maintain the stability of the regime, they have no bandwidth for actually containing the virus outbreak. The most important thing to the Chinese Communist Party is to safeguard its regime. If we look at the people in charge of leading the efforts to contain the virus outbreak, it is obvious that none of them has any expertise in public health. This is an amateur team trying to give orders to a group of public health experts and their real function is not to contain the virus but to maintain social stability in China. From the perspective of enforcing censorship, the task force has done a brilliant job. CCTV has been broadcasting how developing countries are praising China's efforts to contain the epidemic. However, since these are all countries that have taken huge amounts of loans from China, they are paying China back by praising its behaviors unconditionally, he says. This is one of the most challenging moments in the Chinese Communist Party's 70-year history. The first major crisis it faced was the Great Chinese Famine, during the Mao Zedong era. era. Second major crisis was the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989. Now we have this public health crisis. Even though Beijing tries to censor online discussion about the epidemic, they still can't achieve a total blackout. Chinese people already know most of the facts about the epidemic. Even many Chinese officials probably know that they're lying about the epidemic. From my observation, the Chinese government is monitoring society through tracking the development of the epidemic and many methods of maintaining stability used in this epidemic could be applied to similar events in the future. I think the Chinese government is using this epidemic to strengthen its control over society. It is hard to say if the whole pandemic would force a regime change within the Chinese Communist Party or not. Right now, everything is still very murky. 21st of October, I said, unless we're now going to Xinjiang the whole world, the current modus operandi is running on empty. Uh, 5th of March, writing about Xinjiang, where the risks must be uh, uh, sky high, has unveiled a digital panopticon in Xinjiang. As I said, viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. This measures how quickly observed genomes share ancestry to estimate the rate of potential exponential growth, arriving at an estimated doubling time of 7.2 days, in line with previous modeling estimates from case data. The linearity of 2.1 is therefore a conundrum. Now, as I said, let's move on to the international markets. China contributed about 28% of global economic growth, according to official data. I wrote about the feedback loop phenomenon. We call it the China, Asia, EM and Frontier Markets feedback loop. I said it's been a positive one for the last two decades, but now it's in a trend reversal phase. Moving on, let's go to the currency markets. Euros at 109.54, dollar index 98.61, Japanese yen 109.81, Swiss franc 0.9772, the pound um, 129.02, the Australian dollar 0.6704, India rupee 71.351, South Korean won 1188.04, the real record low 4.3199, Egyptian pound 15.7633, and the rand 14.98625. Uh, dollar index, this chart is from FX, PIP, Titan. It looks in a good uptrend. Euro dollar 109.54 rebounding a little after yesterday's sell-off. Netflix, about which I recommended, you will recall in September last year, has had a tremendous run. Not as good as Tesla, of course. 
Gold, let's have a look at where that is, 1571. I think it's well underpinned. I wouldn't be selling it. I would be buying it on reverses. Crude oil, $50.55. Let's see how that does. Emerging markets, JP Morgan index of emerging markets, foreign exchange is at a new low since its inception a decade ago. All is not rosy. John Alphas. And that again is the China EM frontier markets feedback loop phenomenon. Sub-Saharan Africa, interesting how every single test in Africa is coming back negative. That's Kamau uh, Wangari. Wall Street Journal, Africa girds for tough fight against virus. In hospitals across Uganda, the government is hastily constructing isolation units awaiting their first patients. In Ethiopia, officials are exhorting citizens to report on anyone displaying virus-like symptoms. In Zambia, the government is pleading with citizens stuck in China not to return home. While there have been no confirmed cases of coronavirus in any of the continent's 54 nations, the World Health Organization has warned that Africa's ill-equipped healthcare infrastructure could be a soft underbelly for global defences against the virus, which has already spread to 25 countries since December. Estimated 1 million Chinese nationals live in Africa, double that, and around 80,000 African students live in China, according to Johns Hopkins University. Many in the city of Wuhan, the epicenter of the outbreak. Considering the size of the Chinese population in Africa and the large number of people who continue to go back and forth, it's either incredible luck or poor screening that explains why there's still not a confirmed case on the continent, said Eric Orlando. The available bed capacity nationwide cannot accommodate more than 30 patients, that's Uganda. Isolation units lack oxygen supply systems and laboratories. We are really still short on supplies. A medical official of the Ethiopian Ministry of Health is seen here preparing to screen passengers at the airport in Addis Ababa. Bole, of course, is the epicenter of China-Africa hyperconnectedness. We've been flying to China since 1973, so it will not be ethical, it will not be morally acceptable to stop flying to China today because they've got a temporary problem. That's CEO of Fly Ethiopian. And then taking you back to DW News and Zhang Lifan, since these are all countries that have taken huge amounts of loans from China, they're paying China back by praising its behaviours unconditionally. With the support of the World Health Organization, we now have the capacity to test for the novel coronavirus. This is Lia Tadese, the Minister of Health in Ethiopia. Uh, this should be interesting, I tweeted. I have to assume, as I said on the 27th of January, that the virus is already in Africa, but just not diagnosed. I came across this short video, Uhuru, 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 it's rather good, have a, have a watch. Addis Ababa, of course, yesterday was a raucous symphony of church bells and calls to prayer and squawking birds and motorcade sirens as dozens and dozens of state leaders made their way to the AU summit. Here you see President Ramaphosa arriving at Bole Airport in Addis Ababa, welcomed by Dr. Abi Ahmed. He said we must deal with the action of countries outside our continent that are fighting proxy wars and fueling ongoing conflicts on our continent. Of course, the main theatre for proxy operations is Libya. Abiy Ahmed is seen here welcoming Justin Trudeau, and uh, I, I would be quite worried had I got been going there this weekend. Locusts are affecting 57% of Somalia's farmland and 83% of Ethiopia's cropland, satellite data shows. Jeffrey York, as I wrote before, we're currently under plague of locusts and Al-Shabaab attack here in Kenya. Locusts will likely be the winners on a warming planet. Warmer seas spawn more cyclones and more cyclones, especially sequential ones that give locusts wet soils to breed in as they march across the landscape could mean more locusts, Jeffrey York. South African all shares up 0.34%. Touching back on the China EM frontier market feedback loop, I said the purest proxy was the RAND. The RAND on Friday was 1.4% lower at 15.11, its weakest since November 1st. This is a chart from Wave Basis. We're currently at 15.01. We could blow out big here. 
Egyptian pound 15.7624, EGX 30 up 1.05% year-to-date. Nigerian all share up 4.56% year-to-date, but it, at the peak this year it was up double that. Ghana Stock Exchange down 2.68%. This is a Che Guevara mural in Sumbe, Kwanzaa Sul province via Angola Roads. He said, I'm not a liberator. Liberators do not exist. The people liberate themselves. This is uh, Najib Balala praying for President Moy via Asmali 77. It's got a lot of traction, this photograph. You can see why. Worried about Kenya's fiscal stability. Well, the national government is the problem. That's Kenneth Opalo. Here you see landing a herc at a hastily constructed airstrip in remotest Kenya. That's from Gleno Glaza 1. Nairobi all shares up 1.35% and the NSE 20 is down 1.96% year to date. Thank you.